All right, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining the 2020 PCL virtual reunion. Uh, my name is Zach Ford. I am very happy to be your host today. Um, a little bit of background on me um, and why I am interested in the Old Pacific Coast League. Uh, my great uncle, Larry Powell, played in the Coast League in the 30s and 40s. So, um, you know, dating back to the early 90s, mid 90s, when the reunions were first starting, I was able to meet him at the reunions and uh, spend some time with him there, um, meet a lot of his old teammates and opponents and uh, became friends with a lot of the uh, ball players from that era and fans from that era and personnel from that era. Um, and uh, even had my own newsletter for a short time uh, during high school and college, uh, providing updates on uh, the whereabouts of uh, PCL players and personnel. And uh, it's always just been something that's been extremely near and dear to my heart, the old Pacific Coast League. Um, and some of my very fondest memories uh, of being, you know, in high school and a young adult um, are the relationships that I made, the, the uh, interactions I had uh, with a lot of my buddies um, who unfortunately are no longer with us. Um, but um, their memory definitely lives on. Definitely, imp they definitely impacted us all, and that's why we're here. Um, so. Um, in addition to your host, I'm very honored to be an advisory uh, committee member for the Pacific Coast League Historical Society, and um, I'd like to pass it over to Mark. And this program is going to be pretty uh, unofficial, um, informal. Um, we want to make sure that there is engagement uh, amongst all of us, and uh, we can, you know, go down memory lane. So go ahead, and Mark, and we're Mark is our uh, director of the Pacific Coast League Historical Society, and he'll do some recognitions and start things off for us. Thanks, Zach. Uh, and again, this is uh, different for all of us this year, um, but we, we didn't want to break a streak. I think all of us have broken streaks this year, things that we did traditionally, whether it's going to baseball games or road trips or uh, visiting family and friends. Uh, so we, we wanted this uh, continuity. Uh, it would be great if we were all gathering in person, but again, we, we make the best what we can uh, do. Uh, this is technically the 26th year that we've uh, done this. Um, uh, I took it over uh, in the fourth year in uh, 1998. Uh, everything started, of course, with runs, hits in an era that uh, Bill Ramondi was referring to earlier uh, at the Oakland Museum. And uh, the three years following that, uh, both uh, Dick Dobbins and uh, Chris Rogers ran the reunion. In uh, early 1998, both of them were ill and uh, were not able to continue this. And so I reached out to uh, Mark Medeiros and to Dick Beveridge to see what it was gonna take to continue it. And uh, I figured it would last for three or four years. Uh, 20 something years later, we're still going at it. Uh, everybody enjoys themselves. The one thing that's drastically different uh, when I took it over in 98, we had 60 former players and uh, front office people. And uh, as Zach had said earlier, well, uh, many of them and most of them have passed on. We have pictures, we have memories uh, and, and such uh, of all of them and a lot of good times that we shared. And uh, now it's to the point of the next chapter of you know, dealing with uh, uh, the, the memories, the memorabilia uh, and the families. And um, uh, clearly when, when Dick Beveridge uh, got ill himself uh, a few years ago, and uh, I was contacted. I, I was not able to take over the responsibility of the PCL Historical Society myself. I wonder how he was able to do it all these years. Uh, but uh, we, we did put together uh, an advisory committee, uh, Zach, of course, uh, being one of them. Uh, other members who are here, uh, Joy Ogrodowski. Uh, Joy is uh, uh, been a wonder to work with. Uh, she's helped out with uh, the, the uh, flyers that we do for the reunion. She's been able to do uh, the, uh, uh, the virtual potpourris, uh, taking care of all the typesetting and uh, laying out the pages, uh, been an asset herself. She's been interested in baseball her entire life. Uh, if you recognize her last name, uh, you'll recognize the uh, connection to the Pacific Coast League. Uh, we also have uh, Bill Swank uh, on our advisory committee. Uh, Bill's expertise is in San Diego baseball, and uh, he's written a number of books. 
uh, uh, writes articles regularly for the uh, potpourri and uh, has always been a, a good go-to person for uh, stories as he's interviewed uh, uh, hundreds of ball players uh, uh, over the years. Uh, let's see, uh, I'm looking through uh, Alan O'Connor. I don't see here, but I'm assuming that you're here, uh, hopefully on page two here. Let me see if I can find uh, uh, Alan. I still don't see him. But, uh, I did admit I him. So he's there somewhere floating there around in virtual uh, wonderland. Okay. Uh, Alan, of course, is our Sacramento specialist. Uh, also uh, uh, done uh, a number of books. He's just recently completed a book with uh, Tom Crisp on uh, uh, basketball, which we probably won't talk about too much today, but he's actively involved in, in uh, research and sports history. Uh, he provides articles on a regular basis to the potpourri and uh, you know, been, again, very supportive uh, and very helpful. Uh, uh, Dick Beveridge, of course, could not be here. I spoke with him yesterday. Uh, he's having uh, repeat health conditions and uh, not very computer savvy and felt it would be best to uh, watch this online after the, uh, the actual live uh, version is done. Uh, Bob Hoy, another of our, of our researchers, uh, we haven't been able to reach Bob now for several weeks and we don't know what's going on, uh, but uh, Bob is another one behind the scenes. Uh, that, that helps out. Ray Saracini, uh, with, again, it was invited. I haven't seen him uh, join up just yet. Uh, he was going to try to make it. Uh, Ray, along with Dave Eskenazi from Seattle, uh, provide a lot of input with uh, photos and uh, 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 biographic uh, support and research. They've both interviewed a lot of players over the years and uh, have been um, you know, uh, very, very supportive to the PCL Historical Society. Um, I'm looking through uh, some familiar faces here on the first page. Uh, most of you are members of the PCL Historical Society and receive the newsletters. And um, uh, it, it's, so you're already familiar with how we do things. Uh, it's, it's a not-for-profit -for group. Uh, there's no charges uh, uh, currently uh, for any of this because we simply have no expenses. The, uh, uh, the newsletters are all done uh, online and virtual. There's no printing, no mailing. Uh, and and uh, all of us that are involved on the advisory committee are all volunteers. And so, as we said, if any of you don't like the work and want your money back, we give you a double your money back guarantee for uh, anything that uh, you're unsatisfied with. Uh, but it, it is really a, uh, a cooperative effort. And, and it's, it's been uh, you know, a, a mixture of the, the families that have provided us with information, the players that have uh, provided us with information, uh, not just today, but over the years, because it, this has been ongoing for uh, decades and I hope that it continues for many, many years. The reunions themselves, I know uh, people like, I'm looking at the screen, Bill Klink, uh, you were a regular at the uh, Southern California uh, functions. Uh, the Carson reunions went on for years and were really the granddaddy of all the PCL reunions. Uh, in the heyday, there was uh, close to 400 people that would show up, again, over 40 players. Uh, it, it was, uh, uh, you know, it just, you know, the granddaddy of all of them. The, um, uh, the Oakland, of, of course, museum hosted us for many, many years. Uh, the last 10 years, we had transferred from Oakland over to San Leandro, primarily due to costs and such. Uh, Bill Swank had uh, organized a, uh, a reunion with the PCL Historical Society, and he's done a number of other ones in San Diego for the local players down there. Uh, and there have been reunions mostly tied in with the run sits in an era that were uh, held up in uh, Portland and Seattle as well. Uh, but anyhow, it, it's, it's great to see the, uh, the turnout today. It, it, it's very, very different than what we're used to. At least we have an opportunity to, uh, to see each other. And uh, we're going to open it up in a few minutes to uh, uh, some questions and such. I'll probably start off with a few questions for the players. And again, there's a few pages of images here. So I'm hoping that I see everybody here. But I, I definitely see up in the top corner for me, uh, Tom Munoz. Uh, Tom uh, played for the Oaks uh, uh, back in the 1950s. Uh, he's been uh, a, a great supporter of our reunions for many, many years. And uh, for a, a period of probably eight or 10 years, uh, Tom and I both hosted what we call baseball weekend in August. Uh, Saturday would be the Pacific Coast League reunion uh, at the Oakland Museum. And Sunday would be the California League gathering at his house out in Byron. And it was probably one of the most fun weekends that you could ever have for the year to, uh, to be a part of that. So Tom, if you want to uh, unmute yourself and uh, say a few words, uh, and then I'll go on to the next uh, introduction. Okay, uh, Mark, I'd like to thank you very, very much and everybody that got together and put this on. It's wonderful. 
and I hard to recognize faces at our age. We sort of change a little bit. And mm -hmm. uh, I haven't seen Chuck Simmons in uh, I don't know how long. And I'd like to say hi to Chuck and uh, Don Farber and uh, uh, Ramondi and everybody there. I just, it's a pleasure to be here, pleasure to be part of it. And Mark, if there's anything that I can do in the future, please let me know. You got it, you got it, Tom. Well, next uh, player I'd like to introduce is uh, Don Farber. And Don, of course, uh, he played for the Oakland Oaks briefly in 1954 uh, and a few years in the 1950s. Uh, I know that um, uh, he attended one or two of, of Tom's reunions out there. This is probably going back 10 or 15 years ago. We've talked a few times over the phone, and I'm really glad that you were able to make it out uh, today, Don. Uh, even though your name says Lynn, we're going to call you Don. That, <laughs> We understand the, uh, the connection hookups here, uh, but uh, I was going through some photos uh, this week and I found a, a real nice shot that uh, you'll remember, uh, spring training of 1954, where the Oaks were all down in uh, Monterey. And you, of course, made the, uh, uh, the team and, and uh, you were down there. Uh, you're a couple of people away from uh, one of our other longtime attendees who's now passed on, Bob Murphy. And uh, you know, Bob was, was a, a, a great person. Many people remember from the Oakland reunions when, when Bob and, and uh, Bud Watkins and Charlie Silvera and Ernie Berlio would take the stage, how much fun it was to, to listen to those stories, which uh, I think, Zach, you have audio on most of that stuff, don't you? <laughs> I do. I'm very blessed to have uh, captured a lot of that. And I actually have them now transferred to my handy dandy iPhone, believe it or not. Switch them all, the digital files, very, very cool. No, that's great. And I see also on my screen, uh, Chuck Simmons. Uh, Chuck, again, a uh, bat boy for the Oaks during probably one of the most legendary eras, 1945 to 1951, two championships. Uh, was absolutely loved by the players. Uh, he, he was uh, not uh, considered a lowly bat boy. He was part of the family there. Uh, I'm sure his experiences, I know he shared a lot of them with me. He shared a lot of them with Zach and a few others that have gotten to, uh, to talk with Chuck over the years. But Chuck, I'm really glad that you were able to make it out uh, today. And uh, we, we won't pick on you, but your name's going to come up a few times today. And, and hopefully we'll get a few words from you as well. Thank you again. I'm ready for you, Mark. I'm ready for you. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> okay, so let me sneak over to the next page and see who I might be uh, uh, missing here because there's quite a few that have uh, come in. Let's see. Steve Heath. Steve, you and I have never met, but uh, Zach had told me that you are a bat boy for the Solons uh, back in the 1950s. And uh, we're going to learn a lot more about your involvement uh, and in some of your experiences a little bit later on uh, today. But I'm really appreciative that you joined us. Uh, I understand that you attend the, uh, some of the Sacramento functions, and I'd like to be able to meet with you in person at some point. That'd be great. Thank you. Good to be here. I'm glad to know I'm not the only former bat boy in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not alone. You're not alone. So, okay, and then I'm, I'm looking through here. I see a few authors. Um, I see a lot of regulars, of course, that uh, make our, uh, our reunions and such. And I'm, I'm really glad, again, that, uh, that all of you made the effort uh, to come out. Um, let's see, I, I guess what we can start with, uh, Tom and, and, and uh, Don, since you're the only two players that are here right now, and both of you played for Oakland. Uh, and in fact, both of you were at uh, spring training in Monterey. So why don't we talk about the experience that you had in Monterey? What a great place to go for spring training. It was. I'll go first, huh? Go ahead, John. Okay. Uh, in 1953, I went to the final doubleheader that the Seals played. Uh, they were in Seals State, and they played uh, Hollywood. And uh, Tony Ponzi pitched both ends of the doubleheader. He was there for 16 days, and he, he ended up 8-0. and 0. At that time, I was going to Cal Poly, and I signed with, uh, I signed with Oakland, and uh, we had spring training in Monterey, and uh, we, we opened up against the Seals, and, and my first uh, venture in pro ball, and Tony Ponzi was pitching. He opened up and uh, he had knuckleball. The first one was high. The second one, I hit out of the park. And, and I like to tell everybody that I started at the top and worked my way down. That, that was my baseball career. 
I, I, I played it in the Albuquerque and Wenatchee and in the Channel Cities, which was Santa Barbara Ventura. And I also played in uh, Fresno and uh, got married and started a family. Well, that's great. Uh, Tom, do you have anything uh, additionally, uh, some stories you can share from, uh, from Monterey that year? Yeah, but uh, I don't know if I could say them in public like this. Uh, I, I, uh, I, have, I have a lot of memories that, and the older I get, the more I forget them. But uh, uh, I had a wonderful career and uh, my very first uh, thrill in my lifetime was my first year, I was 17 years old and the New York Giants come around for, for spring training at the Oakland ballpark and uh, Mel Ott was managing. And so he told me to, uh, Alan Gettle was pitching and uh, uh, let me see, who was, the, who was the other pitcher for the Giants? And, and I'm sorry, one, one second. It looks like somebody is sharing their screen. I think it's Leo Smith. Okay. If somebody could stop sharing their screen because now we're, we're going to see all your emails that are popping up. How do I do oh. this? And I don't know how that would have happened because I didn't think that I had anybody gave any of the, anybody the ability to do that. Is that better? No, let me try and. Because we're viewing Leo Smith's screen. How do I get out of it? It shouldn't be happening. I may end up having to remove you and then you could just log back in. Okay. So, yeah, I'm going to end up just removing you real quick and then you could just click the link to get back in later, okay? Sounds good. All right, sorry about that. That's or if you could just leave the meeting and then, and, and then click back in. How do I leave the meeting? Just click click out of here. On the bottom on the bottom right, there should be an area. Bottom I don't right. know how I would have given you permission to share your screen, but <laughs> I don't know how I got in. I don't even know how I got into you guys. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna just go out and start over. All right. Okay. No, I'm still there. Well, no, close close out close out Zoom, not close out. So the the area in which this meeting is taking place, you're going to have to stop. Close out Zoom. I don't know how to do that. Zach, the, there that, you are. There okay. you go. Did I just bump there them out? Yeah, okay. That, yeah, I think that did it. There you are. Okay. There's Mark McRae. That's hey, good. I'm back. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry about that. Um, but we got things figured out now. Um, sorry, Tom. That's okay, um, no problem. Yeah, anyway, as I was saying, I was 17 years old and, and uh, pitcher for the Giants. I, I can't think of his name. Uh, he's one of the top pitchers. Started the game, and DeRocha always had them go three innings and change pitchers after that. But he had a perfect game for six innings, and uh, Ellen Gettle was going to come up and mail out looked down the dugout and and I guess he saw me there and he said hey Tom he says go up and break up his perfect game and with that I couldn't breathe I could barely walk <laughs> and I figured god I can't this guy is huge so I get up there in the second pitch I hit a line drive right back to the box and broke up his perfect game and then that was uh, there was two outs and the next batter made an out and I was on first and I rounded second and got almost to third base. I ran better when I was younger. But then I uh, I come back to the dugout. We were at first base side. And as I crossed over the mound, he looked at me and he said, nice hitting, kid. And with that, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget the tone of voice. And that was the biggest thrill in my life in baseball. <laughs> That's an awesome one. Great. Now, what do you guys think about like, the, the road trips and such? I know that uh, that was one of the fun things that always used to come up at the California League reunions, more so because it was more, uh, I guess you could say, um, intimate at your reunions than we could share at, at some of the uh, uh, Oakland Museum gatherings and such. 
Uh, but uh, there, there were some great stories that, uh, from the road trips, uh, sometimes just driving between one city and the next and uh, the experience of being in a bus for 10, 12 hours and, and all that. Uh, what do either of you guys uh, remember from that that you can share? <laughs> No. So, Don, do you have any uh, right. recollections of road trips? Uh, oh, yeah. We, we, we were in up in Wenatchee. We were in station wagons. Uh, there were three abreast, and it was pretty crowded. And uh, get a little little rank in there once in a while with all the ball players. But other, other than that, <laughs> other than that, uh, I. You, I like traveling in an airplane, but that didn't happen that often. But uh, uh, station wagons and then buses. and But you know what? Everything was sort of, I couldn't do it now, but I was just glad to be in, the, in that car three abreast. Because I knew that once I got there, I'd, I'd have to put my spikes on or my glove and go out and do whatever I could. And uh, believe me, I tried. Yeah, also that, uh, Tom, that uh, that road trip from Wenatchee to Edmonton wasn't oh, a lot of fun uh, in a uh, 54 Plymouth station wagon. That was, yeah, that was a long next, trip. Sitting next to George Kelly, who was about six foot six, and there wasn't much leg room or even. Oh. <laughs> no, there wasn't much anything. No. Now, which uh, stadiums were your favorites, guys? That's oh. Jackie Burke Jr., Mom. That guy. What about me? He's Jackie Burke Jr. He was one of the... Again, if everyone could just uh, mute themselves if they're not one of the speakers, it'd be great. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll unmute uh, uh, Tom and, and uh, Don. I was going to ask them what their favorite stadiums were the, uh, on the Coast League that they joined. I know, understand with uh, Don, you were only in the Coast League for a limited amount of time, but uh, we can even include some of the other minor league parks that you went to that were your favorites and, and well, perhaps yeah. even why. So when you did these road trips, it wasn't just for a single game. It was a couple of games that uh, would happen and for the PCL a whole week. So. Well, Oakland opened up in, in 1954 in Sacramento and uh, then came back to Oakland and, and then I went to Wenatchee. Uh, my favorite, I guess, was uh, a Calgary where, where the fences were about 290 feet away. <laughs> and uh, and that, was a, that was a good trip in a, in a marvelous little, little city uh, at that time. And then the Coast League, uh, and in the uh, California League, I liked the Visalia and uh, Reno. It was fun. It was good ballparks. Very good. Tom, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, uh, I, I go along with them in, in the California League with Visalia. And uh, that short porch in, in Canada was pretty cheap when I was in Wenatchee. And it was close. And uh, uh, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed going there. And... Uh, you know, you, you, you stand up to play and you look and you go, no, that can't be true. But it was uh, beautiful and uh, uh, everything was, I'm just so thrilled that I had that career. Thank you, Mark. Well, great. Um, uh, let's go over to, uh, to Steve. He's, you know, Steve, as I said, I, I haven't had the opportunity of meeting you before uh, until today and, and talking with you. Um, you were bat boy for the Solons. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you got the job, how uh, how long you were at it, and maybe share a couple of interesting stories that uh, that you had. Sure. Uh, what I tell people is basically my first job, which was visiting team bat boy for the Solons in '59, was probably the best job ever, and it's been downhill since. But great thrill. I was 11 years old. The year before, I had seen an, an article in the Sacramento Bee written about the Bat Boy that year and, and all the fun he was having. And I said, I wanted to do that. So I started calling Bill Golsong, the, uh, the president of the bowl club, and, and Bill Brenner, the general manager, weekly at times, until finally Brenner said, if I give you the job, will you quit pestering me? 
And I said, yeah. And, uh, and so I became the visiting team bat boy, which was a great place to be. The Solons were not a bad team that year. They actually had a winning record, which was kind of uncharacteristic for them. But I got to meet the guys on the other ball clubs. Uh, and that would include Willie McCovey, uh, who was at, at the Phoenix uh, club for part of that year and then went up. I got Maury Wills, Brooks Robinson, Frank Howard. I mean, it was, it was a, a dream job for a kid. Uh, and, and by the way, I was also a shareholder of the Sacramento Solons. There was constantly economic turmoil with the Solons. And the year before, they had sold shares to the public, $10 a share to save the Solons and keep them in Sacramento. And being a 10-year-old kid, I couldn't afford the 10 bucks, but I bought half a share for five. So I was not only an employee, I was a shareholder. Um, a lot of great memories. I got, I got to keep the broken bats, which... Uh, my mother then disposed of while I was living out of state. I don't know whatever happened to them, but I had broken bats from McCovey and Jose Pagan and all these guys in, in her garage. She got rid of them. The picture I've got up on the screen behind me, the 59 ball club, is also testimony to the fact that my mom wasn't that big a baseball fan and wasn't particularly impressed that um, I had to miss a, a weekend series when Spokane was in town. Uh, because the family decided to go on a vacation, there's nobody for me to stay with, and that was the, that was the weekend they took this team picture. So I'm not in the team picture. Uh, uh, one of the great regrets in my life. It would have been fun to have that as a as a memento. But you know, again, great memories. People like uh, Steve Bilko, who used to let me raid the bubble gum box in his locker uh, when the, uh, when Spokane was in town. He he was a bazooka guy, by the way. He, he kept a full box of bazooka bubble gum on the top shelf in his locker. Um, guys like, uh, interesting guys, Charlie Metro, the manager in Vancouver, who uh, had quite a temper, got really upset at the umpires one day, emptied the dugout of uh, hats, towels, and everything else he could get his hands on, helmets. Uh, I, I, I had to go out and pull everything back into the, the, the dugout. And as soon as I got them all back in, he threw them all out again. He hit Bob Elliott with the Solon's manager with one of the helmets and and uh, Elliot winged it right back into the dugout at him and, and, and almost got me. I mean, it just on and on, great, great memories. The, the manager at Portland was a guy by the name of Tommy Heath, no, no relationship, uh, a, a total character. He, he, he had used a glove in the, for a pad to sit on on the wooden benches in the dugout. And then he, he used to like to, to play games on me and he would give me this flat mouth glove and tell me to go shag balls in the outfield. And of course, it's like trying to play catch with a, a piece of plywood, uh, but uh, you know, two dollars a game, all the broken bats I wanted for the entire season. Now that's great, and it was an, a, a memory of a lifetime too. It sounds like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Zach, yeah. if you can unmute uh, Chuck Simmons, I uh, will ask Chuck. Chuck, of course, is uh, is participated in a number of these different PCO. Uh, historical society gatherings and meetings over the years. Uh, Chuck was in Oakland from uh, 45 to 51, two championships, the 48 and the 50. Uh, Casey Stengel, um, we go right down the roster, Ernie Lombardi, Billy Martin, Billy Ramondi, uh, Dario Lodigiani, uh, all these guys that uh, he got to grow up with for, uh, for six uh, seasons and, and such. And, and yeah, just an incredible uh, childhood. Uh, he stayed involved in baseball. Uh, are you still giving the docent tours at Petco now, Chuck? Uh, no, I finally gave up on, uh, on Petco to cement, got next to my knees. But uh, no, now I'm with the San Diego Historical Society. Well, that's great. I'm glad you're still involved. You got so many memories to share. And I mean, just uh, from the time that you were in Oakland and, and such, uh, you and I have talked about this in the past and you've been very uh, good on sharing a lot of stuff, both with me and with, uh, with Zach over the years. Uh, maybe you have one or two short stories you'd like to, to share with some people who have never talked with you. Well, I, I was fortunate. Uh, probably the biggest thrill I had in the seven years I was there was personally meeting Ty Cobb. And I still have that autographed baseball still in the coffee can and this nice black ink. I don't have it. My son's got it now. And it's going to my grandson in November when he gets married. It's his wedding gift. Uh, but uh, gee whiz, uh, just, just being with all those people at the same time and uh, over those years and meeting some future Hall of Famers and some people going up to the majors and coming down from the majors 
uh, Cookie Lively, Gerald breaking up Bill Bevins home run in the 47 series. The, the next year he's with the Oaks and I'm rooming with him. And uh, just, just, just being with those people was uh, the biggest thrill as far as stories. Probably, I don't know if people remember 1946 when Jackie Price was with the ball club. And uh, during infield practice, Jackie uh, would do his silly thing and leave his uh, fly open and catch the ball in his fly. When he reached in for the ball, he'd come out with a snake. And uh, when he left to go to Cleveland at the end of the 46 season, I inherited the snakes. So I had to rush them up to the scent to the Oakland Zoo real quick, like. <laughs> but just just being around those people, uh, being on a bench with Casey, that was like like being in the library having somebody talk to you. He just full of stories and full of full of laughter. Except when it was time to be on the field, of course he was more serious. And of course, being a young man, liking a lot of thrills, the the, the big fights we had, Billy Martin and Lou Stringer, Ferris Fane and Cotton Pippen. Mel Desabu and Max Sircant. And I got to hold Mel Desabu's dentures while he went and met Mr. Sircant in right field. But <laughs> and traveling with those guys was a joke. We, we didn't start flying until 48. So 45, six and seven, we rode the train. And that was fun with those people. I just, uh, and Casey let me pinch hit once again, Stockton in the, in the preseason in 1948, and I almost didn't get to play high school ball because of that. They said I was a professional. I was getting paid for my job, 250 a game. But I played one time at that, and uh, the OAL, the, the late Tommy Minos would, would recognize the OAL. Uh, they, they didn't want to let me play ball because I was a professional, but they took care of that, and I, I, got, I got to play. The last time I'd seen Tommy was 1951, I believe, and he was at San Leandro, and I was at Fremont. Yeah, so... But uh, Chuck, yes, I was just saying, Chuck, you you told me a, a, a awesome story uh, a while back about uh, I believe it was you were in Portland when the war ended and you got the news that the war ended. Can you share that? Yes, I was across the street from the hotel in the movie theater watching Salome where she danced. And uh, all of a sudden the lights came on, the curtain closed. And they told us that the war had been declared over. And so I shot right back to the hotel because I almost had to go to the ballpark anyhow and found out the game was canceled. The players are up in the room. They were tearing up telephone books and throwing the paper out the window. And uh, it was hard to find food. They closed most of the restaurants and uh, we had uh, popcorn for dinner and <laughs> it was just a wild scene. And it, it couldn't have been a more historical place for me. It was my first major road trip with the team in, uh, in, in 45, August of 45. And uh, I, traveling on the train was one thing, but having the war end right there and being with those guys to celebrate it, it was something different. And uh, also there was a, the relationship that you had with uh, Casey was pretty close. And uh, it ended up, you know, there was actually even an offer for you to, uh, leave Oakland and, and go to New York with yeah. him. Can you tell about, to tell well, us about Casey been, and that, uh, yeah, it, we, we that have relationship? Training, we had spring training down in the San Fernando area. And uh, I spent most of the time I was there you know, in the hotel, but Casey had me over to his house. He and Edna, really nice people. And uh, then in 49, when he went up, uh, he said, do you want to come along and be our bat boy? I'm sure I can get you in. And, and I had just started high school and, just about to buy my first car and just about to have my first girlfriend. So I was pretty situated right there in Oakland. And uh, I, I appreciated the fact, but uh, when I was a youngster, we had moved from Jersey to California. So I kind of was happy in Oakland rather than go back to New York. But uh, just, just Casey offering that to me was quite a thrill. Well, thanks, Chuck. Um, a, a question that just came up, you brought up uh, Cookie Lavagetto's name, and uh, uh, one thing I was going to uh, talk to both Don and, and uh, Tom Muniz about, um, in 54, of course, uh, uh, Cookie was one of the coaches, uh, but the manager, Chuck Dressen, um, he got along with some guys okay, and, and other players he rubbed the wrong way. Uh, I can remember a story that uh, Bob Murphy told or actually illustrated at one of the reunions many years ago that had the crowd roaring for about 15 minutes. But uh, what was your uh, experience uh, with uh, with Dressen? Did you guys get along with him okay? And, and did you see him, yeah. how he treated other players? Kind of 
if I had a choice of of fathers between Mel Ott and Chuck Dresden, Mel Ott would be my daddy. But, <laughs> and and I was lucky. In '48, Casey moved me from Casey moved me from the Bat Boy. We had a little clubhouse of our own, and I got to go in and, and change clothes with the players. And I had the corner locker right by the right by the shower. Well, in when. Chuck Dresson was there, and you probably heard the story in the shower where they got into a little fiasco and went from $50 fine up to a couple hundred dollars. I was right there changing clothes, listening to all that. So that's still in my mind, that argument that went on. And uh, yeah, that, that Chuck Dresson was not too, not too happy with the world, I think. <laughs> to me, he seemed to try to emulate Leo DeRocher, and he didn't know how to do it. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was that was one of the big stories about Dresden. My my Chuck Dresden story, and Tommy will remember this. Uh, we were we were playing Hollywood, and, and Bernier was the uh, uh, Carlos Bernier was on first base, yeah. and apparently I had a history with Dresden. And Dresden started yelling and screaming and swearing at him in Spanish, and 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 uh, Carlos Bernier looked at him and. Uh, I think it was, uh, it might have been two gun Gettel, picked them off first base. That was hilarious. <laughs> but my my dealings with uh, with uh, Charlie Dress were, were very few. Cookie, I like. Cookie was a regular guy, low key guy. That always wanted to borrow your shower shoes or, or a razor blade. And then, and then in 56, Dresser went to uh, the Washington Senators. And from there, I think he went to Detroit. But he, he was in a league of his own, always with the alligator shoes and the silk suits. Quite a guy. He was a different person. <clears throat> yeah. But Tom, do you have anything to, uh, to add to that on uh, Charlie Dressen? Charlie Dressen? Uh, no, because I, I was just there spring training and then uh in 53 uh i went up to uh, wenatchee so i uh i didn't have much doings with him uh in spring training a little bit and he uh he was he was fine uh i was only i was only 18 years old and jim marshall was uh, was the first baseman and uh, i tried to trip him a couple of times but it didn't work <laughs> And, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, Charlie was okay. Uh, I can't say I, I would have enjoyed playing for him, but if I had a chance, if they picked me, I would definitely enjoy it. Oh, I, I'd like to say something to, to uh, Bill, Bill Klein. Uh, thank you for my baseball picture. I saw it when you held it up. I appreciate that. And, uh, if you want to sell them, I heard they're worth about 35 cents. How about if I do this for you, Tom? I'm going to make you a real good copy of this and mail it to you. How about that? Oh, I would love it. I, would I do love need it. one thing, though, Tom. And you yes, guys sir. are going to have to tell everybody else, too. Tom, I need your mailing address. Oh, OK. We could probably uh, share that uh, after the, uh, the meeting. Sure. I'll, be happy to I'll tell you what. OK. Yeah, okay. where you yeah. can send it to Zach. Zach can send it to me, however you want to do it. Or else I'll send it to Mark, I'll email it to Mark or something. Yeah, yeah but that's good. I'll, I'll, I'll get it to you. Okay, and, I'll get, I'll get you a good copy of that front and, and back. I appreciate it. And, that's and the 55 uh, set that Doug McWilliams put out. It's a wonderful set. Oh, good, okay. And one question to Chuck yeah. Simmons. Chuck, did you ever get an invitation, I don't know if I should be talking this way, an invitation to my baseball party with Ernie and I gave it to our house? Because I sent you an invitation one time. Oh, I don't believe so. Where are, are you still living up in the, in the San Leandro area? No, I, I right now I'm living in Sonora. Oh, wow. that's where, Yeah. No, I don't recall. I don't recall getting anything. Okay, because that time there I was living in Tracy on the Delta, and we had uh, oh god all kinds of ball players. We had it every year. Ernie and I would throw a big party at my house. And it was wonderful, and, and I wanted to share that with you, but I'm sorry, I you didn't get the message early. Evidently not. <laughs> I'd, yeah. I'd, have, I'd have been there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, because it was it was nice, it, very organized. In fact, uh, 
I even invited Mark one time. Then I Mark. I, I think there was only one time that you didn't invite me. You no, so I, know. <laughs> I know. I know. Mark, a lot of fun Mark, out there. This, this truck you got, I forgot to mention to you, I did get involved with Little League quite a bit from the 1960s up to 2000, where I, I even umpired in the League World Series in 86. But I was uh, the president of the Little League when an eight-year-old named Billy Bean came into baseball. So I, I've watched Billy Bean go a long way. Yeah. Okay, anybody else got any awesome. questions for me? So Tom O'Doul, do you have any uh, stories that you'd like to share? About your cousin, some people right, might recognize uh, the uh, the similarity in last name, and I know you you've always been uh, great to talk with at uh, the functions in person. It's great to see you today. Well, thanks, Mark. It's uh, it's just good to see all you people. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, kind of going along with me on that postcard with a mystery name. We figured out that it might be uh, George Stinson from uh, 1911, 1912 in the PCL, and I know everybody that's uh, on this Zoom today. Uh, doesn't remember 1911 or 12, <laughs> neither do I, but it was uh, kind of a mystery. And I think we've, we've solved the mystery of who that, uh, that signature was. So we've got everybody on there. Charlie Graham, Mayor Rossi, the DiMaggio's, Lefty O'Doul, uh, who else, and then Charlie. So uh, it's, it looks good. Uh, stories with Lefty, I don't know. It's, it's probably when he told me when I was in high school, he said, you love the game, enjoy the game, but don't ever think about being a big player. <laughs> But anyway, it's it's great to see everybody here today, and uh, I enjoy enjoy these every year. And well, I know Lefty Lefty would like the the way it's carried on. From uh, from a fan's perspective, Zach, can you unmute Bill Shub and uh, Barry McMahon? And uh, the questions uh, you know to these two, I know there's others on the second page that I currently can't see. But uh, growing up and and following the PCL well before the major leagues came out west. Uh, and, and, you know, just idolizing uh, those players as if they were, which they were, the West Coast major leaguers. Um, both of you have enjoyed, uh, let's just say, more than four decades of uh, uh, experience with baseball and, and following baseball and such, but uh, it always gets back to your roots. Um, can each of you share a few minutes on your favorite players and those uh, maybe a couple of interesting experiences that I know both of you have a lot of, but that would be great. I'll start with me. Go for it, Bill. Yeah, I lived in North Oakland uh, uh, and uh, in, in the 40s, of course, the games weren't on television. There were no major league uh, teams on the West Coast. Uh, and the only sports really that people paid attention to uh, at that time that I was aware of were baseball, college football, and maybe boxing. There, there was no basketball to speak of or professional football. So I would listen to the Oaks games uh, at night at a little radio in my bedroom. I guess I was a kid about eight or 10. And I would listen to Bud Foster announce the games. And, and that's really how I learned about baseball, uh, the terminology and so forth. It, it's like learning a foreign language and you, you, you pick it up. Uh, he would say that it, it, when there were three outs, he would say, and the sides retired. And I thought he meant that they went to bed or something. Uh, so uh, once in a while, uh, my parents would say, let's get in the car and, and go down to the ballpark and see the game. We could do it in the middle of the game. You'd be listening to the game. My dad would get in the car. We'd go down. We'd park. Uh, we'd always sit on the third base side and uh, watch the games. Uh, I, I have the memory of the the park being so big and in in those days when 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 the game was over you could walk from where we would sit on the third base side out of the park through the ballpark center field somewhere and get out and i would run around the the, the grass and pretend that i was playing my uh, my favorite player was billy ramondi uh one of the reasons for that strangely enough was that uh from the time i was in about the first grade i had to wear glasses uh, and uh, Billy was the only player that wore glasses. And uh, so I identified with him. And uh, I remember my dad telling me he was a catcher. And uh, you, you watch, Bill. He said uh, when, the, when there's a, a pop fly, uh, he asked all the other catchers take off their, their masks. 
uh, but but Billy leaves his mask on. So I, I, I took note of that, little things that you, you picked up. And then the only other thing I want to comment on it was the baseball cards. Uh, we would go around to the, uh, to the grocery stores. Uh, when you were old enough, uh, you take your bike down. The one day of the week, they would get the baseball cards for that week. And you'd have to rush in and get your baseball card. Or somebody ahead of you would get a stack of them. The people in the grocery stores would give a whole stack of them to the first few kids that come in so they wouldn't have to worry about all the other kids coming in and bothering them for these baseball cards. So it was a big deal to collect, to collect those baseball cards. I started collecting them in, in 47, and, and then I had to go back and pick up the ones that I missed from 46, the, the Remar Sunbeam cards. And then I started, I collected them again. Of course, the Signal cards and the Smith's cards and, and the Sunbeam cards from the other years. Uh, and so when I started coming to these reunions, it was a big deal. I go to Mark's table, big deal. Find some of those baseball cards that I might have missed. Uh, and all the memories of picking those cards up and just looking at them, looking at them. You didn't get pictures of the players in the, other, other than on these baseball cards. And you'd stare at these baseball cards and, and sort of fantasize about it. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Barry, do you have a few things to add uh, on growing up in uh, uh, British Columbia and, and when the Mounties came to town? Well, I was 10 years old when the, when the Oaks moved up to Vancouver. We went to a few games that year, but 57 took in quite a few. And that's when they had the great pitching staff, Maury Martin, Bamberger, uh, Don Foresi, Herb Polika. But the little guy out of the bullpen, Sandy Quanswig Raw, he was good. And I can remember him packing his jacket in all the time to the Mount Metro would meet him there. And uh, he, Sandy always had the look like, how come it took so long to get me in here? And he'd get the guys out. Sandy was good. And then, uh, of course, 58, we had a good team. 59 had the great infield. Barker, Breeding, Hanson, Robinson. But my favorite player in the years following Vancouver was Joe Taylor. I mean, Joe could, Joe could really hit, but he liked to party, too. And anybody who would know anything about Joe would know that. But the ball just seemed to make a different sound coming off his bat. I don't know what it was. He, he could really hit. And, uh, you know, he's, he's drinking lots. And uh, we had uh, one, I'm not going to mention the teammate, but one, one guy told me that uh, Joe was a low ball hitter and a high ball drinker. You know, they had, everybody had a story about Joe. Anybody who was a teammate of, of uh, Joe Taylor, like the O'Brien twins, they told me lots about him. And they were, you know, partnered up at, uh, at Seattle together. And Joe was a great, and Joe, I'm, he, uh, I contacted Joe three times over the year and he died in, I think it was 93, but uh, he was really good. You know, and all the players that come into Vancouver, like Bilko, you mentioned, they were all approachable. You know, you go down to the dugout. I remember when Buddy Peterson came back with the Solons to, he'd been with Vancouver and then he went to Sacramento, came back. And I said, Buddy, how about signing my, my book here? Okay, you want any more, any more in there, kid? And he would take it down the dugout to come out, Jim Bolger, all these guys' names. On, you know, they, everybody was, everybody that came to town, and they all stayed at the Sylvia Hotel. All the visiting teams stayed there. And, uh, you know, that, that was a, just a great time. And it'll never be the same again for me, baseball. I mean, the expansion in the big leagues now has ruined minor league ball, I think. It'll, we'll never be able to go back to that. Great times. Capilano Stadium was a great ballpark. Still is renamed Matt Bailey, but it's great. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. Well, thanks, Barry. Uh, we also have a couple of family members here who have been supportive for a number of years. I just see uh, uh, Kurt Lorkey changed the, uh, the name on his screen. Uh, it was a different initials. I didn't recognize him at first. And then uh, James McGee, uh, uh, both related, of course, to Jack Lorkey. Uh, mm -hmm. Jack had come out to one or two of our reunions at the Oakland Museum years ago. Um, he's been gone now several years, but uh, uh, one of the, the nice things about the Pacific Coast League Historical Society, and in particular these reunions, is the continuity of the families, the next generations coming out. Um, when you know, we, we use Zach as an example, when uh, Zach was a, uh, a teenager coming out and meeting ball players uh, that had played during his great uncle's era in the 30s and 40s, it, it sort of shaped him for life, and he was able to get stories from a lot of teammates. 
of, uh, of Larry's that, that knew Larry Powell uh, really well over the years and, and stories that he wouldn't get from, from anybody else. And that's one of the, uh, the great things that continues with uh, the families being involved. Um, but uh, Zach, if you want to unmute uh, James McGee and Kurt Lorke, we'll uh, welcome both of them. And if you guys want to talk a little bit about uh, Jack, uh, his career, that would be great. All right, James is now unmuted. I think that Kurt will have to unmute himself. Okay, there we go. We're set. There we go. We got him. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you guys have a, a few uh, stories that you'd like to share about uh, about Jack. Well, one of the, this is Kurt. Uh, one of the gentlemen, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. One of the gentlemen had mentioned uh, Jim Bolger. And I think my dad had mentioned when he was with the Sacramento Solons, and I, I can't even remember back if he was managing or coaching. I think he was coaching in Sacramento, but that name stuck out. So I think Jim Bolger might have played for Sacramento back in those. I think he wore glasses. He was a big fella, played first base, I think. But anyway, that name stuck in my head there because uh, my dad, of course, was friends with, you know, best friends with Larry Jansen and Whitey Lockman from the old uh, New York Giants. But other than that, constantly, you know, remember those days in 51, he was on that team. He always used to, you know, talk about that team. But uh, other than that, everything's going okay with this pandemic, just trying to stay busy. <laughs> and of course I missed, you know, Mark, last time I had that surgery and I know you've had it, but I had a a bad uh, appendectomy where, you know, it took me out for a while. <laughs> yeah. well, plus you're a couple thousand miles away from us too, if you're still living in the same spot. Yeah, well, I, well, my house is in Florida, but I'm in, you know, California now, you know, up the street there in San okay. Jose. Good, but, uh, good. My house is still in Florida, but uh, traveling back and forth has been a little limited lately. <laughs> but, uh, other than that, I'm here with my mom, 94, so she's still still kicking, so can't complain. That's great. That's great. I'm glad that uh, she's doing okay. And, you know, I wanted to add one thing, Kurt. Uh, one of my favorite pictures um, is a picture of uh, you and your dad from, uh, I think it was when he was with Hollywood. Isn't that, the right, isn't that right, Kurt? I think you're maybe, what, five, six years old in that picture, and both of you have just got the biggest smiles. Just love that picture of you guys. Yeah, I think that the Hollywood stars. Because <laughs> I remember, I don't know who he was playing for at the time. I remember going down to, uh, it might have been a giant. Anyway, Brawley in South, you know, California on uh, spring training and driving down there when I was just like four or five. But uh, I'm trying to remember. I remember the old... Um, <laughs> Rock, they used to have rock gravel dog on, uh, you know, warning tracks back then. <laughs> you knew for sure when you got on the warning track. <laughs> of course, that's changed a lot today, but uh, those were good times, yeah. A lot of, you know, when I played minor league ball, it was the same way with the uh, warning tracks in the outfield in the Carolinas and that. So, anyway, yeah, I think uh, that, and I think the picture that was with uh, him and Emmett Ashford was with the Hollywood stars when he got, you know, <laughs> our big, that picture with a big argument with Emmett Ashford. <laughs> so that's always a good memory. So I wish me and my brother would have kept all the world series baseballs that when they played the Yankees, you know, and he had the mantle and the, the magic and all those uh, baseballs. But of course, we played with them as kids and ruined them. So <laughs> I wish I had those back. <laughs> See, Chuck did the right thing with his Ty Cobb ball. He took care of it. And uh, yeah, now it's something I heard that, that. Yeah, <laughs> put it away in a can more sign. Generation. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be worth a lot. It's already worth. Well, thanks, guys, for sharing those stories. Uh, I want to go to uh, one other person. Uh, this uh, a person uh, is, is known uh, you know, by all of us. Uh, and uh, he's the, the only family that's attended all 26 functions, uh, and that's Bill Ramondi. And normally, uh, you know, we have uh, 
uh, at least the sister, sometimes Matt, uh, sometimes uh, uh, extended family, but the Ramondi family has uh, represented us all 26 years. Uh, we had uh, Billy and, and Al for, uh, well, Al for a few years at least, and then uh, uh, Billy made it for many times, and it was always a pleasure to, to see them at the reunions, and then uh, sometimes in between we would get together. But, uh, you know, Bill, I appreciate you continuing on. Zach, if you want to unmute them, and we'll, uh, we'll maybe uh, uh, ask a, a couple of stories or something uh, that you can share, Bill. There we go. Well, I was... You know, I was born in 53, so uh, a lot of what I know about the Coast League was uh, from going to the reunions. And uh, uh, my sister June couldn't make this meeting today. She would be the one. She was, uh, she's 14 years older than me, and she knew all the ball players. And, um, I, you know, there's not much I can, can really add. Uh, I remember hearing stories, uh, and this would probably continue into the 1970s when realtors would offer houses in uh, the, the area where your dad lived. They would point him out as one of the selling features of Alameda, uh, that this house is right down the street from Billy Ramondi. And uh, I guess uh, transplants from the Midwest or the East Coast would try to figure out, well, who's he? But uh, everybody in the Bay Area knew who he was. <laughs> yeah, and I had never, I had never heard that. Um... But I'm not surprised. He was very popular and well loved, and uh, and uh, wish my mom was was around to tell you about her thoughts about Chuck Dressen because she didn't like him. <laughs> he, tra he traded my dad, and uh, she said it was because because my dad was real popular, and uh, you know caused quite a commotion there in Oakland. The headlines of the newspaper and. I think the owner of the team finally talked to uh, uh, Bill Noland, who owned the paper. He was a, a senator from Oakland, a state senator, and uh, told him to quit quit uh, writing about Billy Ramondi being traded. And uh, but my dad never said anything bad about Dresden, but my mom sure did. <laughs> Well, I don't think I always ever said anything bad about anybody. Uh, all the times that we talked, he was a very positive person, upbeat. Yeah, and I was just going to add one of my uh, some of the uh, the best memories I have from my old Coast League interviews are um, um, with the Ramondis. And um, when I used to go around and interview ball players, um, I started this actually before I even had my driver's license. So one of the first um trips we made my dad and I was to Alameda to interview Billy Ramondi and uh I remember your your dad was way too humble of an interview he he didn't he didn't uh want to brag or boast about being a professional baseball player in the Coast League for I believe it was 22 years and I was asking him questions about, yeah, what are some of the most memorable Pacific Coast games? He said, I don't know. You know, I kind of played them all and the same, you know, hard. And, and then your mom from the other room would be like, what about that time in extra innings where you stole home to win the game? Said, yeah, I, you know, I got a little bit of a lead. It was a little steal home. We won the game. What about that time you played all the positions? Yeah, there was this one time where they had a promotion and I played all positions. Your dad was so incredibly humble and so incredibly welcoming to me as a young boy. Um, and uh, that's definitely not forgotten. He's definitely one of the most memorable, most um, impactful players that I had the opportunity to, uh, to meet during my, you know, teenage years. And it's definitely some, you know, one of those people I think about regularly. Thank you, Zach. Thank you very much. Uh, just thought, want to add that Marty Lurie, who uh, uh, you probably know who he is. He does the radio uh, shows for the Giants. He, he did the A's. He also interviewed my dad, and he had the same experience that my mom was more anxious to answer questions and gave him more information than my dad did. So <laughs> you were the first, and Marty Lurie had the same experience. That's awesome. 
I see another name here on the, uh, the front page. Uh, we've met, I guess, about 15 or 20 years ago, and he is not a ball player, but he certainly hung out with a lot of the ball players in the day. Uh, his dad was very well known to people in the East Bay. Uh, his dad ran a sporting goods store in uh, Oakland. And uh, uh, Howard Rose, if you want to say a few words, uh, I know we talked uh, earlier this week. Uh, hopefully, I don't see your picture, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, the fans here will appreciate the fact that you didn't put your picture up, so we don't have to look at you, but you can share some stories. Howard, are you there? <laughs> Oh, he's not, Howard is he's, going he's not muted. Maybe he just stepped away. He might have he's... stepped away for a second. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure on that. Um, on my first page here, I also see another name. Um, uh, he's um, uh, an important person down in San Diego, Tom Larwin. And Tom is the uh, director of the San Diego chapter of Sabre. Uh, but Tom and I became, uh, well, we met each other many, many years ago, but we became better friends uh, after uh, about 2013, 2014, when uh, Tom sort of um, inherited the responsibility of uh, uh, organizing a 2 million document collection that weighed, what, 36,000 pounds or something like that. <laughs> so Tom's learned an awful lot on the PCL, uh, whether uh, by, uh, uh, by choice or not by choice, but he's, he's worked with the San Diego Public Library uh, and uh, also as uh, a director of Sabre chapter down there on uh, organizing the, uh, the Bill Weiss uh, collection, which uh, he's, he's probably gonna be working on it for many more years or his successors will be working on it for many more years as well. So Tom, do you have a few words to say about uh, that experience and, and what you've learned on the Coast League? Well, <laughs> I'm Johnny come lately on the Coast League. Uh, I really didn't get involved in PCL until uh, we started doing some work on Ted Williams in the 1936 pod, Padres a few years back. And um, I, I'm, I've been a diehard Cubs fan and moved out from Chicago. And uh, the, the PCL was Steve Bilko and these players that would be coming up from Los Angeles to, to the Cubs. And you know, the Cubs were always, uh, they'd finish as high as fifth place, I think, a few years. But when I was growing up in the 50s, um, it was always, uh, could they stay out of last place? But anyway, uh, when I met you, Mark, uh, it's got to be at least six years now, maybe seven years ago, when you called me up about the Bill Weiss archive. I didn't know who Bill Weiss was. Um, I didn't know much about PCL baseball, but subsequently... Uh, uh, it's been my life. I retired about a few years before that, so I was able to take the time to, to really manage it. I love meticulous things, and I, I told you before, uh, every time I see a banana box, I think of you. <laughs> uh, yeah, how many? Uh, 600, 600 banana boxes that we went through, but every time I opened up one of those banana boxes, it was like a Christmas gift. I'd, I'd see things that just made my day. There were publications and statistics and letters. And uh, so we've got it all inventoried. We've done, we tried to keep up with digit, digitiz digitizing the uh, material. Uh, the 120,000 questionnaires are now available on Ancestry that um, Sabre has helped with uh, getting them publicized. So we're trying to keep uh, up with everything. We're going through uh, uh, box scores, Carlos Bauer and I, Bill Swank, we get together on a lot of the stuff. And uh, now our focus is more on San Diego history. And in the next uh, year, we hope to come up with a book that will uh, detail the history of San Diego professional baseball between 1870 and the PCL Padres when they started in 1936. So thanks to you, Mark. It's been a great uh, acquaintance that uh, to have met you and work with you. And by the way, I do have a uh, connection with Chuck Simmons. My wife worked with Chuck for a number of years at the San Diego Convention Center. And um, he spoke at our meetings a, a couple of years back when he was a younger man. So, but thanks for the invitation. I, th I've been to one other of your PCL Historical S Society meetings and that was the one in San Diego. Really enjoyed it. And for one reason or another, haven't been able to get, get to any others. So. Thank you. Keep doing a good job. I love your newsletter. And uh, thanks again. 
Well, thank you, Tom. Chuck Simmons to Kathy. I said hello. It's 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 great that uh, what you're doing in San Diego. I know you've got a good team down there, and that's uh, really what it gets down to in a lot of cases. One person can't really do the, the volume of work and in, in anything. And with uh, Carlos and and Bill helping you out, and I know initially there were more volunteers, but I know how volunteering works out. Uh, the volunteers <laughs> get tired after about six or seven hours, and well, I, uh, the dog needs to be washed, or the I've got to go, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to Tijuana for some uh, tacos or something like that. So all your volunteers are, are, are just sort of retired. But uh, keep up the good work, uh, and it's great that that Padres book that you guys did a few years ago was incredible. It shared a lot of information on the early team and, and uh, uh, it's, it's great to see where you're, you're able to gather all that data. It helps both Sabre uh, and the PCL Historical Society, but 50, 60 years from now, it's gonna save somebody uh, hundreds, if not thousands of hours of time and going out and trying to gather all this data. So it, it's, it's appreciated by a lot of people. Thank you. Awesome. So Zach, uh, I'm gonna I'll let you take over for a second. Do you have any uh, other uh, questions of, of the uh, the guests here today? Uh, we well, we actually we haven't heard from Bill Swank. So why don't I, I jump back in there and, and Bill, you've been hiding behind that uh, uh, that paddle for uh, uh, a half hour or an hour at least. Uh, do you have a few words to say? Well, you know how much problem we had last night hooking up to Zoom, and uh, finally got it working. Can you hear me okay? Yes. And I've never been on one of these Zoom things before, so I'm wearing my PCL Historical Society mask. I don't want to get coronavirus from you guys. Uh, but Tom was very, uh, very generous, including me, uh, with the work that he and Carlos uh, have done. Uh, it's just been unbelievable. You know, uh, I, we'd hook up at Costco uh, after these guys have been working all day. but. Uh, Thanks to uh, what Bill Weiss did, and and uh, it, the thing that's so wonderful about this group is, if you need anything, you know who to go to, and everybody's all willing to help out. So uh, I've really enjoyed looking at the back of my mask. You there? I'm there. <laughs> Too much, Bill. Well, at least today we have half a picture. Last night it was just a blank screen, and I'm glad that you were able to uh, to get through it. Um, well, I feel very I'm, safe with my mask on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, and we all what appreciate is, that. You see this? The name badge. Jack Graham. Oh, okay. You know what it says on the back? Property of the Pacific Coast League Historical Society. Do not remove. <laughs> Jack walked off with it. I said, hey, Jack, you're not supposed to have that. And he said, wow, what is it? And I said, well, hey, autograph it and give it to me. So I mean, this thing is probably 25 years old. I just I saw it in my room and I thought I'm going to wear it. So Merry okay. Christmas, everybody. And wear your mask. Okay, Bill. Hey, thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. You bet. So Zach, I'm gonna turn it over. Do you have uh, any uh, questions you wanna bring up? Uh, sure, I was gonna pass it back over to some of the old Pacific Coast League bat boys. I guess we'll start off with Steve. Um, so when you got that gig in 1959, tell me about how that uh, kind of changed things. You, uh, your, uh, your friends, uh, you know, at, 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 in the schoolyard, any, any jealousy factors there? Any special weird requests? Or? They were wanting tickets all the time. And, of course, Bat Boys didn't get tickets to, to give away. So what we told them to do was what we did before I was a Bat Boy, which was go out behind the, 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 uh, the ballpark along Riverside and along Broadway and watch for fly balls, fall balls coming out of the ballpark during batting practice because if you gave them to the – the usher at the gate, they'd let you go sit in the, in the bleachers for free and watch the ball game. So that was those were the free passes that we were able to, to give the kids. Mm -hmm. Listen to Tom Larwin talk about San Diego and the history of the Padres brought back a great memory, which was uh, getting to play pepper and play catch with Jimmy Fox, who was a coach for the Padres that year. Babe Ruth's old uh, roommate. And what he could do with a fungo bat was amazing. I can still see it. He had a, a, a bat that was sawed off hat uh, in half, flat on one side, wrapped in, in uh, white tape. Hey, Reese. 
I'm not saying raise and, and you could could uh, could pitch. He could he could throw curveballs. He could you know it was it was amazing what he could do with that bat. Uh, and getting a chance to play catch with him, you're right, not, Reese, not Fox. Um, Larry Doby was at San Diego that year. His career ended at Edmonds Field when he slid into the base and, and shattered his ankle. I can still hear that in my mind. Um, heck of a, of, of a ball player. A lot of great memories brought back. I really enjoyed it today. Thanks for, for letting me join you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Chuck, you... Uh... You had also told me a, a, an interesting story about how uh, uh, Mel Ott gave you some tips on uh, changing your batting strategy that year he was manager in, in Oakland. Yeah, that's right. Uh, because, you know, in Oakland, the, the right field fence was, what, 311 feet, and I was always trying to hit the ball out there, but I couldn't. The only place I could hit the ball would be over the shortstop. I'm left-handed. Hit the ball over the shortstop's head, and so... Mel he would let me take some batting practice and he would always watch, always watch. And finally he'd come up and just told me how to, where the ball should be when I hit it. Don't wait till it gets over the plate. Get out there and meet the ball. And I tried to raise my right foot like he did and come down, and stomp the ground, but it didn't work. But he just had me switching my hips and all of a sudden I started hitting singles when I got on the team. <laughs> <laughs> very good yeah. very good you had a little bit of an interesting uh relationship too i think with uh daria lodigiani had already moved on to scouting and there was a little bit of an opportunity for you there after high school obviously you didn't you didn't take it but tell yeah, me well, about how that he, materialized yeah he offered me uh not a contract on my ability and you can ask tom about that he outplayed me at first base mucho <laughs> but uh, yeah, Dario, because he liked me real well, and he had a younger brother that used to come to my house and spend the night with me. He passed away, and I was we, he, we stayed pretty close. Uh, but he offered me a contract to go to Sweetwater, Texas, at a very minimal fee, and I said, "No, I'm I'm going to go in the Navy anyhow." So I went into the Navy, and I went to Kingsville, Texas, for seventy five dollars a month. <laughs> but I did play ball for twenty three of my twenty six Navy years. I played for the Navy. And uh, yeah, but, but Dario, wonderful guy. Very good. And I guess this could be for both the bad boys um, and, uh, and the players too, I mean, as in Farber. Um, one of the highlights that I always heard from the players when I was interviewing them were the, um, the schedule, the Pacific Coast League schedule, how you'd have, a, have a, a travel day on Monday, then you'd have, you know, games, you know, Tuesday through Saturday, a doubleheader on Sunday. Tell me about uh, your experiences with, uh, with that schedule and how it differed from, you know, the other leagues that you played in. Well, as far as me, I, I, I didn't play in any leagues because I oh, wanted yeah. in the Navy. But, uh, but, no, the schedule as far as my schooling and so forth, that was great. And uh, I did miss a lot of school because I did travel quite a bit with the team. And people mm -hmm. always said, how did you get your grades uh, up? And, well, a broken bat and an autographed ball go from a ceiling <laughs> problem <laughs> but no yeah. the schedule for me was fine yeah. but we didn't, about Don we didn't and travel Tom. Oh. we didn't travel the, especially not the, the visiting team bad boys we didn't yeah. travel with the ball so. yeah I mean, the, as far as uh, Tom and and Don how did can you share your experiences on uh, Pacific Coast League schedules and and travel uh the only thing that was real confusing uh when they played the Seals, they had a split doubleheader. They played morning game in either Oakland or San Francisco and then traveled across the bay to play the second game on Sundays. And that was, uh, uh, I've never seen that or heard of it since. And uh, I guess it, I, I guess they did that to get more attendance. And, uh, but it was, uh, it was a weird situation. Hmm. What do you think, Don? Oh. What I remember about those split, those split double headers was uh, left the old duel was uh, finished at Seal Stadium. Then they were driving over to Emeryville, and he had Neil Sheridan and Joe Brovey in the car, and he stopped the car in the middle of the bridge, and he said to them, "Do you know who's leading the team in hitting?" And so, and I, one of the players said, uh, "Joe Futernick." He goes, you're right. And if you guys had any guts, you get out and jump. That's uh, it was a little, uh, a little 
little left-handed hitting uh, shortstop. But, uh, that's what I remember. And also for Chuck, uh, Daria Little Johnny's had a relation, a relative that, that lived next door to me, Al Pacini, Al Pacini. Yeah. And uh, he used to go over uh, when, when Lodi was with, uh, was with Oakland. And he told me the same story that, that you did, that uh, they, they, let him, they let him pinch hit one night and then they wouldn't let him play. Uh, they was playing for Burlingame High School. He had that same situation. <laughs> yeah, you know they, yeah, because we're professional. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He was 16 years old, 17 years old. But that's it, Zach. All right. And Tom, I, if I remember right, I, I remember a story about a uh, your cousin and another gentleman, I believe it was, visiting you at a Little League game when you were a kid. The DiMaggio show, uh, my Little League opener. <laughs> yeah, my dad had asked uh, cousin Frank to come to the opening. Uh, day game because it was be, it'd be cool to have a major leaguer there or a former major leaguer, and Odul shows up in the in the Cadillac and he's got DiMaggio with him and it was something I'll never forget. The kids just went nuts, you know. We had a great time. So, you notice I changed hats. So you were talking to the bad boys, so I put on my bad boy cap from Seal Stadium days. Uh, but I remember that uh, that meeting to Joe DiMaggio was really cool. It didn't stay long, but it was it was something that. It was really special for a 10-year-old kid, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Mark, uh, I'm going to go ahead and toss it back to you, see if you have any questions. And then I figured that uh, after uh, after that, or if you didn't have any follow-up questions, maybe we could open it up to uh, let some of the fans and other participants uh, either share their experiences or ask questions of the players or personnel. Well, that, that's a good idea, Zach. Uh, I think for this this part of the meeting, uh, we'll open it up, and um, you know, again, we'll try to be one at a time. Uh, any questions to the players, the Bat Boys, um, or any of the other people that you see on the screen? Uh, we'll try to do it one at a time. Uh, if one person wants to chime in, go for it. And if you're if you're shy, you could also comment in the uh, in the comments section, and then we either Mark or I can. Repeat it as well, whichever you would prefer. Barry, I had uh, something I wanted to say to you. I have a photo of you and a, a, a Mountie that you had taken in a parking lot, I believe it was, up there. I want to say it was, and I always have trouble, Mark, with this guy's last name. Jim, is it Dyke or Dick? Dyke, uh, Jim Dyke. Jim yeah. Dyke. I have a photo of you. Uh, uh, kind of arm in arm. It's at one of my favorites. It's at my other house or I'd show it to you. Uh, but uh, if you want, I'll make you a copy and send it up to you. It's a wonderful photo. You've got a, a an old green um, a Plymouth, I think it was, in the background that looked like there. It might have been yours or Jim's car, but it's a nice photo of the two of you. And I remember actually you sent that to me about 20 years ago. Yeah, I got to know Dyke pretty well. Uh, and he lived in Shaney, Washington. He had a bowling alley there, the Shaney Bowl. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I watched him in Vancouver. He played, he played 21 years of professional baseball. Anyway, he played for the, for the Reds. It starts with the, he was the final out for the St. Louis Browns. He was facing Billy Pierce, and he flew out to Bill Wilson in center field. That was the last out for the Browns. But he was just a great guy. He came, he came up to my place here on Vancouver Island, and you know, on a fishing trip, him and his brother, Art, and two other guys. And uh, we, we, he was just a great guy. I sure miss him. I used to keep in touch with him all the time with the phone, you know. Yeah, great guy, Dyke. Um, yeah, Art's still, I think Art is still alive. I'm not sure on that, though. But uh, he had a lot of stories, Jim. Played for a lot of different players. Thanks, Barry. I Any had a question? question. I had a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, I'm a relatively new member of the PCL uh, Society and a lot of time on my hands. So I'm buying lots of books to read so I don't go anywhere. And I got this book. Mark knows about this. And, I, and, and it has an inscription from one player to another. But I don't know who the players are. So I thought so I'd just read it. It's very short. And maybe in, in particular, Steve Heath might be able to help because 
they were salon players. And, and it reads, to old lefty, my roomie, here's to our relatively short journey through salon's history. We didn't exactly dazzle him, but we stayed there long enough to be remembered in this book. Those years were most valuable to me because you were and are my best friend and signed Heckle. And he goes, P.S., thanks for throwing me that fastball in Phoenix. <laughs> And I have no idea. I've looked through the names of lefties and try to match one. And this is a 1995 book. So um, I don't know if anybody has any ideas who those two guys might be. Oh, no, that's interesting. Lefty. Lefty and Heckle. And they were roomies. Heckle. So obviously yeah, one was a pitcher because he threw a ball to him in Phoenix. Yeah. And I'll keep <laughs> trying to research it, but I just thought I'd comment and I have enjoyed my all my reading, um, I'm probably as far from the coast as possibly can be because I'm about two miles from the Atlantic Ocean. You see it's dark out my windows. Uh, but I'm old enough to remember a lot of the players from the 50s, although I wasn't exactly following the PCL at that time. Too bad my old boss, Bill Commons, is not still around. He, he didn't know. And I was a sports writer for the union for about nine, ten years. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, I, helped I could, me so far. I could almost guarantee you that Alan O'Connor would be able to answer your question right okay alan's no, on right. right now so he uh, and actually i had sent that query to him uh when you and i talked about this last month right. and uh it didn't ring any bells uh but since you brought it up and, and heckle he's probably going to write it down because uh, another one of our friends that does a lot of research up in yolo county baseball history and, and such is going to uh, try to do some digging as well and so again, hopefully we'll find the answer for you, but it's a nickname that none of us have heard of. And, and we've talked to a lot of players and heard a lot of different nicknames. Uh, we've heard nicknames that uh, players were given by the media and also nicknames that, were, that players were given by each other. Cause there's sometimes two different uh, nicknames that, uh, that go about. And, and you know, up till now we couldn't find the answer, but if anybody here on the screen has the answer, definitely chime in. And you know, that does, make me remember a particular player. Um, and I think that all reunions have to have some sort of Bud Watkins story. For those of you that uh, attended reunions in the 90s and early 2000s, Bud was a regular and he was one of the most uh, um, just, he was, a, he was incredible, incredible man who uh, was one of the best storytellers um, I was able to uh, meet throughout my Pacific Coast League um, interviews. And, and uh, you, you bring up the, the roommate story and it has a little bit of humor and I figure, okay, well, and it's Sacramento and it, it sparked my memory of a story Bud Watkins told me. And so when Bud was growing up, he grew up in the Chicago area, and one of his favorite players as a kid was Orville Grove, pitcher. And, you know, Bud gets, you know, many years later, he had a scrapbook of Orville Grove, all this stuff, right? And, you know, in the Coast League, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the star major leaguers would end up going, you know, down to the Coast League to wrap up their careers. So Bud Watkins gets called up to the Solons. And I believe they're in LA at that time. He reports to the hotel, told to go up to his room. His roommate's in there, you know, this is your room. He goes up to his room. And his roommate's in there and guess who his roommate is? It's Orville Grove. So, Bud Watkins says he didn't sleep at all that night. He just sat there in his bed looking at his childhood hero, just not being able to believe that he was rooming with Orville Grove. And there are a lot of stories like that with the Pacific Coast League, with the guys going up and down. Uh, but I figured that, uh, you know, even though this is a virtual reunion and Bud's been gone for quite a few years, that this, uh, this reunion definitely needs a Bud Watkins story. Because he was, he was definitely a character. 
Zach, I was going to tell you, you, many of you remember, Bud was a tremendous UOP fan. I mean, this guy was Mr. UOP. It was all over his stationery when I'd write back and forth from him. And not ironically, but I think fittingly, he was going to the Big West basketball tournament down in Anaheim. And I think he saw the first game that UOP was in. He went back to his hotel room and he died. He, he died doing what he wanted to do, watching UOP play, you know, at that point in his life. So it was kind of fitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that Bud Watkins was one of the players. Obviously, I, you know, I met him before um, at reunions, but um, one um, Saturday morning, uh, before I had my driver's license and my dad was still driving me around to Pacific Coast of the interviews, we drove down to Stockton and uh, I spent the morning with Frankie Crissetti and then I spent the afternoon uh, with Bud and uh, definitely different, um, different careers. You know, <laughs> Crissetti definitely a higher profile being with the Yankees for so long, but uh, Bud Watkins was just as good of a storyteller from his, you know, Pacific Coast League stories, but uh, always brings back some great memories. Hi, Zach. This is Leo Smith. Can I check in? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and share any questions you have or comments. Okay, I have a story about Steve Bilko. I was a big Angels fan in the '50s, and he came out of the ball after the game one after one of the games. My sister and I were there, and of course, he was one of my big heroes. <laughs> <laughs> And he has a glass of beer in his hand. You know, he liked to drink beer, right? All the players knew that. Well, he came out and looked at me and looked at my sister taking the picture. And he looks at that glass of beer and he says, can't be in the picture. Puts his arm around me. My sister snaps that picture and I have it on my wall. That's awesome. <laughs> it was a great moment for me with one of my heroes. I remember Bill Coe stealing a base against Sacramento. The entire... Ballpark came to a halt. No, no attempt to throw him out because they couldn't believe he was doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I think he had two stolen bases his entire major league career, but he, but that day he took off and everybody just froze, <laughs> watched him go. Nobody checking back in. Mark, who's your favorite ball player? Well, it, it's uh, it's sort of I I grew up uh, following the Oakland A's and. Uh, I guess you could say at the time uh, in the late 60s, it would have been uh, Sal Bando or Dick Green or Reggie Jackson, but I would qualify all those as being the uh, late 1960s versions. Um, when I got introduced to the PCL around 1972, uh, one of the first uh, group of ballplayers that I met, the first PCL guy was Cesar Cinebaldi and then within minutes, Al Earl, who had played back at the turn of the century. And then uh, within that, that same first year, uh, I met Dario Lodajani and Billy Ramondi. And uh, all the, the Coast Leaguers that I met that had played in the, uh, the teens, 20s, and 30s uh, uh, welcomed me with uh, open arms. And they were very eager to share their stories with me then. And uh, many of those friendships lasted for decades. Um, and uh, you know, it, it was uh, what got me interested in the history of the league and, and you know, getting to know some of these players. Um, as Zach brought up with Bud Watkins, if you look at Bud Watkins statistics, uh, they're not Hall of Fame quality. But when you look at Bud Was Watkins, the character and the stories that he could tell, uh, he'd be a first round Hall of Famer. And he would often kid about his success. But, you know, the reality is he made it. And how many here on this screen made it? Not that many made it. So even if he only uh, you know, had a, a, a bad ERA of you know, eight point or whatever, he still uh, got into organized ball and played. And uh, he was well respected years later. Uh, he was uh, one of the best storytellers that we had at the Oakland reunions, uh, which, uh, you know, those, those days up on the stage were so much fun for everybody who went to them. When you get uh, Bud Watkins and uh, uh, Bob Murphy, Ernie Brolio and Charlie Silvera, uh, any couple of those on the stage could uh, entertain people for an hour. We'd throw out a question and just let them go back and forth. They had a real good banter, even though some of them didn't necessarily play together. They all knew uh, about baseball in their respective eras. 
but uh, that that's sort of my uh, uh, connection and story to it. How about Zach, your favorite player? My favorite player? I mean, obviously, I have to go with my uncle. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's definitely the one that um, introduced me to everything as far as the old Pacific Coast League players. Um, played a little bit of time with the uh, the Seals, part of a year with the um, Padres and a few parts of a couple more years with the Angels. Uh, but I would say overall... Um, there are two guys other than my uncle that really stand out to me as far as the old Pacific Coast League. That's the first player I interviewed. And I wouldn't count my uncle as a player that I interviewed just because it was more informal. And, you know, I'd uh, been around um, him so long and so often. But uh, Tony Freitas. Um, Tony Freitas was a guy who um, was a huge star for the Sacramento Solons in the 30s and 40s. Um, and when I was, I was actually in middle school, they called it junior high back then, but I'd go up to the library and do microfilm. And, um, I was collect, putting together a scrapbook from the Sacramento Bee about my uncle's career and, a and a name that regularly popped up was Tony Freitas. Um, because it was, they overlapped the same era. So one day I, I swing by the Sacramento Bee and it's like that scene from um, Field of Dreams where they go to the, um, the newspaper and they try and get tips on, you know, finding people. That's what I did. I went to the Sacramento Bee, asked if there were any old sports writers that I could talk to, get some tips. And there was a guy by the name of uh, Ben Sweezy. Um, who had been with the B since the late fifties. So he knew he had kind of like a little bit of a connection there uh, to that era. And I said, well, you know, who is it that you would recommend that I possibly reach out to um, for my Pacific Coast League research? Because at the time I was trying to expand it beyond just my uncle. And he said, Bill Conlon, Bill Conlon was longtime sports editor with the union and later on with the B. And he said, Tony Freitas. I'm like, oh, Tony Freitas. That's that name that I keep seeing in my uncle's research. And um, he didn't give me the contact information, but he said, both guys are listed. So that's when you'd call up, you know, 411 or whatever. You'd get the, the number. You can just obviously look up a number online. You know, you had to do a little bit of research, but it, I was able to figure it out. And um, was able to connect with Tony. And... Um, after a few phone calls, um, tracked him down, um, very accommodating, um, and, uh, you know, interview over the phone went well, so I decided to ask if I could meet him in person, and I think I was 14 at the time, and I figured out the bus routes, took the bus to his house, um, and spent uh, about three, three and a half hours just talking about his career. And he, he was flipping through his scrapbooks. And it's funny when he answered the door, I just, I blurted out like, so did you pitch to Ruth? He said, yeah, I sure did. I was like, did he hit one from you? Did he off you? He said, yeah, he sure did. And he brings me in and he's showing me the scrapbooks from that particular game. But Tony would definitely be one of the, uh, favorite ball players from the old Pacific Coast League that I had the pleasure of knowing. Um, and it was a funny story too. We spent so much time together talking about his career that the bus times, the bus route had changed. So I go out to the bus route and I'm sitting there for like an hour. And it, I thought it was supposed to be like an every 15 minute thing. So I go back and I, go back to Tony's house. I'm like, okay, well, you know, can I use the phone to call my parents? Call my parents. My parents aren't there. Tony's like, ah, no worries. I'll give you a drive. So we go into his garage and he has like this, and Tony's like 85 at the time. And he has this like nice four by four truck. And we hop into his four by four truck and he's driving us home at like 80 miles an hour. Now, there's a little bit of a backstory there, too, that 
one of the stories he had told me about was he actually got bailed out of jail to pitch for major league scouts in the early thirties because he had got caught and busted for speeding so often. So, you know, 55, 60 years later, I don't know if he learned his lesson that way, but I got a good story from it. He was a great guy. That was, yeah, that was Tony Freitas, I would say probably was um, the, my favorite player from the majority of the Coast League times. Red Adams too was another great guy um, that I was able to have a, a good friendship with and later on was coach with the Dodgers for a long time. In fact, I'm a Giants fan, but one day every year I'll wear a Dodgers jersey with Red Adams' name on the back to Dodger Stadium um, in memory of him. Um, but uh, yeah, those are those are a, a few of my favorites. Now, wasn't Tony the guy that started both ends of a doubleheader? He did. I th I believe he did that at the end of the. Um, I don't know if he started both ends of the doubleheader. I know that f at the end of the 1942 season, um, he. I think he came in relief for the first game, and then he started the second, and then that gave the Solons their only championship. Won both games. But I don't think that was a regular – I don't know if that was a regular thing that he would do. He did pitch, I believe, 15 innings against Dizzy Dean one, one day and ended up losing, I think, in the 16th or something like that. we got to have more stories, don't we? Don't be shy, people. Could I okay. sure – I'll give you a story. Uh, okay, Williams? go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Bill. Can you can you see that okay? That's the uh, the Padres team with uh, Ted, Ted Williams, Williams, right? 1937. And it's autographed. That, that was given to me by Charlene Messner, Steve Messner's wife. And you see young Ted there, 1937. Is it getting too much glare? Is it okay? We can see it. Okay, and then for everybody likes to hear the story about the longest home run that Ted hit at the lane field. It went over the right field uh, wall, landed in a box car, and was found up in Los Angeles. Uh, Pacific Coast League ball, 120 miles away. It was considered the longest home run ever hit until I started researching it, and you pretty much learned that Every town that had a ballpark near the railroad, somebody hit the longest. And Ripley, believe <laughs> it or not, said it was Babe Ruth. And I think it went from uh, Pennsylvania to Chicago, something like that. But those are those are the old fun stories that you don't hear too much about anymore. <laughs> Tom, I think you were saying that you were you had one too. Oh, this is. Uh... I don't know if anybody remembers Walter Mails or ever heard of him, but uh, I'm delivering mail in San Rafael when I first started out and I come up to this house and I see the name Walter Mails and I go, I wonder if that's the old picture from the Seals days. So I rang the doorbell and this man answered the door and it says, Walter Mails, he says, that's me. And I says, the great Walter Mails? And he goes, you've heard of me? And I go, yeah, oh yeah. I says, uh, my name's Odul. Like Frank O'Doul, I go, yeah, he's my cousin. Come in, we have to talk. <laughs> well, needless to say, uh, Mr. Mails and I had quite a conversation and it went on for a few days while I was on that mail route and I was late every day, but I'll never forget talking to Mails. And I asked him about his greatest moment ever. And he says, striking out Babe Ruth in an exhibition game. But uh, it was quite a thrill to, to meet Walter Mails. I'd heard of him, I never saw him play. I never saw Lefty O'Doul play. I'm old, but I'm not that old, as I told Buck O'Neill, who said Lefty O'Doul was quite a hitter, and he was quite a hitter. So, but that's uh, that was a good story of just running into somebody like that that had played. And uh, a little footnote, 
uh, Walter Mayos was born in San Quentin, not the jail, but the little town. That's my story. <laughs> I think Mayo's uh, mother, she worked at uh, the prison. Was it uh, doing uh, laundry or something like that? But he was, I, uh, he's the only uh, player born uh, in the town of San Quentin, which is about three blocks by two blocks, if anybody's been out there before. So. Well, folks, any other questions? I have a question for Steve Heath. Uh, so, Steve, I know you're a uh, uh, that boy for the visiting teams at Edmonds Field, but uh, just out of curiosity, it, did you ever have any interactions with probably my favorite Solons player ever, uh, Nippy Jones? Oh yeah, of course. As a kid, I had a Nippy Jones first baseman's glove because I was a big kid and I was a first baseman and got his autograph and, and got to know him a bit. He was a, he was a great guy. He was, he was an institution in Sacramento for a long, long time. Long awesome. time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Nippy was Nippy was great. That's about the good ball players there that year too. Clayton Dalrymple went up to the the Phillies. My friend Kuno Berrigan, who used to would give me tickets when he came into town as a Cub. Um, some good guys, but yeah, Nippy was a special memory. I I, I don't know whatever happened to that that glove, but uh, it disappeared along with my Solon's hat in one of my moves over the years. Uh, Bob Dillinger played on that team too. 57 with Nippy uh, and, and yeah, I was I was 59. I don't think Dillinger was still there. No, he was there at 57. But yeah, Nippy yeah. started in 57. Yeah. After the the shoe polish on the ball. Right. In the World Series. Yeah. Exactly. And 59, of course, we were the Milwaukee Triple A affiliate, and so the Braves actually came through that year after they had won the, the World Series, did an exhibition game at uh, Edmonds Field, got a chance to, to uh, briefly meet some of those guys, too. Thank you. Do we have any more questions or comments or stories to share? We want to make I, sure everybody has an opportunity. I have a Did question. I say hi? Okay, let's go with Ron. I haven't seen, uh, I haven't heard from Ron yet. Well, I, I want to thank Mark for lowering the standards of the organization to allow a fellow from Oregon to check in. Thank you very much. Great program and enjoy your newsletter. Thank you so much. Question for Steve Heath. Uh, one of my favorites watching Coast League baseball in late 40s and early 50s was Chet Johnson of the Solons and certainly a fan favorite how did the other players respond to his antics? Uh, I'm guessing that there was some mi mixed feeling about it. So uh, Thank you. somebody else said, I'm old, but I'm not that old. I was 11 when I was the bat boy in 1959. I don't really remember Chet. That was prior to my days as a, as a Solons fan, even though I grew up in Sacramento. Okay, Tell me you. about the antics. Tell me what he used to do. Oh, he'd come out. Uh, this was in the Davy Crockett era when kids were going nuts with, with Davy Crockett song and movie and all. And uh, he'd come out of the dugout out to the mound with the Davy Crockett coonskin cap on. And uh, or if the big hitter from, from the opposing team, Steve Bilko or whoever uh, came to bat, uh, he'd, his knees would start quivering. And uh, he he'd go through all the annex of fear, so uh, it, it really was a, a, a nice diversion from the serious otherwise seriousness of the games. And you could count on it, game after game. That's great. Uh, he he had some people to quake his knees at the year I was there, because of course McCovey and, and Frank Howard hit some amazing shots out of Edmonds Field that year. Well, wasn't there also an earlier a, a Solon's pitcher, Chesty Chet Johnson, that used to keep that uh, notebook in his back pocket? If somebody oh, yeah, would get off of him or do something with one of his pitches that he wouldn't want him to do, he'd turn around, take that book out, tear the page out. Tear it out. Yeah, how did the players yeah. respond to that? I think they were saying that was 
that was a little bit before Steve's time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, one of the things too that's interesting um, is um, Chet was obviously known as a character in the Pacific Coast League, but his brother actually had some moderate success, Earl Johnson, in the mm -hmm. major leagues and with Boston. And um, another thing, another memory it, it, it sparked for me was um, when, um, when I was a kid and I'd visit my Uncle Larry's house, he had a picture of him and one of his uh, Red Sox teammates. He ever actually was on a, the team longer than just a few weeks to get into a game, but he um, had a picture of one of the, him and his teammates outside the dugout, and it was Earl Johnson. And um, I found out that he, he had told me that, you know, that was his roommate um, during the short time he was with the team right out of spring training in 1946. And I just kind of thought of it as that. And um, just in recent years, doing a little bit more research, um, I found out that not only were uh, Larry and Earl Johnson roommates at that beginning of that 1946 season, but they were also state, stationed at Camp Roberts in the Army at the beginning of World War II and spent time overseas together. Um, so I wish I had that opportunity to, to, you know, get a little bit more information because that relationship definitely went on, you know, a lot, uh, definitely meant a lot more to him just than those, than those few weeks that they were roommates in, in 1946. Thank you. Zach, that's the importance of a lot of these uh, uh, reunions and the conversations, because uh, as you know, you look back to the uh, interviews that you had in the 90s, and I look back at the interviews and, and conversations I've had with many, both players and families over the years, these stories get lost if they're not told or written down. And uh, it, it's, uh, you know, opportunities like this uh, even though we're not all side by side in the same room, indirectly, we are in the same room, so to speak. And uh, that, that's the only way that these uh, stories get uh, uh, you know, preserved for the next generation and such. I think, Steve, you question? raised your hand. You had a yeah. question. I, I had a question of uh, Lynn Farber. What baseball cap is that? Oh, it's just, uh, just a baseball cap from uh, Burlingame. Okay. No problem. Yeah. I thought maybe it was the Boise Hawks about 10 years oh, ago, no. but maybe not. Yeah. Thank you. Now, somebody brought up uh, Phoenix earlier. And when Tom and I played, Phoenix was a Sea League team. That's how much this country has changed. Phoenix was, a, I forget what, what league it was in. Tucson was in that league. It was, it was a, just the Sea League. Albuquerque was a Sea League. Now they're, uh, they're big league cities. Yeah. Yeah, 1959, that was the Giants AAA affiliate. Uh, down there at Phoenix, the, uh, the manager, the guy by the name of John, I think it was Red Davis. Mm. Interesting ball club. They had, had the worst record in the league despite having had McCovey. Yeah. Got a little toasty down there. Yeah. They moved yeah, down to what, Tacoma in 1960. Well, Mark and Zach, while well, it's kind of a little bit of a lull here, I think we all like to thank both of you and all your guests that were on the show and the ability to talk to people that this was a different reunion, but a fantastic reunion. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I uh, appreciate you uh, participating, and I'm glad that uh, we're at least able to make a virtual reunion ha happen. Obviously, it's no adequate substitute for an in-person reunion, but we wanted to do something during this weird, crazy year. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Leo, and everybody for attending, because, uh, again, as Zach said, this is something that uh, uh, this is one streak that we could keep going uh, at least till next year. Uh, not sure where we're gonna have the reunion next year, but we're gonna, once it's safe, 
uh, we'll make every effort to find uh, uh, a good facility. I know that some of you are from Southern California, some of you are from up north, some of you are from the East Coast, and, and many of you might be attending your first uh, reunion ever, uh, but uh, others have been to a number of these, these functions. And again, we try to keep everything uh, you know, very low profile for all of the attendees. Uh, when we would do the, the reunions in, in Oakland or San Leandro, if there was only one player on a particular subject, if I was doing, a, I want to do a pitcher's panel and only one guy wanted to talk that day, I would never put one person on the spot. And uh, it, 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 it's nice to have, again, two bat boys, two former players. We had three others that were supposed to show up, but for whatever reason couldn't make it. And again, that would happen even at the, the live uh, reunions. Sometimes you wake up in the morning, your back sore, you don't want to go out, uh, you know, whatever it may be. But it, it was truly great to see all of you out here uh, today. And uh, we'll definitely keep you posted. Our, our next newsletter might run a few days late, but it'll be out in January. And we're all going to uh, work on that next. And, and you know, definitely keep in touch with you uh, through email. And uh, if, if there's a, an opportunity to do this type of reunion again, or the interest, please uh, you know, drop me or Zach an email and you know, let us know which, uh, what you thought was good about it. And if you thought anything was bad that could be improved and we'll try to do everything we can to, uh, uh, to make the next one even better and, and get a few more people. But again, I think uh, Zach, it's, it's up to you. If you wanna turn over the, uh, uh, the switch, we can uh, you know, close things down. It's, it's been a, a great afternoon, as I said, and, Zach, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, just in, in closing, I'm glad that uh, all of you are able to join us and uh, definitely hope that there is an in-person reunion in 2021. Um, but uh, this at least has created some opportunities for us to you know, see some folks that we may not even have seen at an in-person reunion in San Leandro. So that's definitely a positive thing. Um, there but uh this is always something that brings back some great memories for me um and i do definitely appreciate all of you for joining and you know sparking up some of those memories for me and it's uh, a special part of my life and it always will be oh so zach zach i like can you hear me yeah i can hear you Tom. okay i'd like to thank you and mark for all the work you've done and it's a wonderful job, and I really enjoy it. But I haven't heard anything from Marlene Vansall. Oh, um, yeah. The, the chair of the Lefty O'Doul uh, Sabre chapter. We'll let her have some a say in here, too. Can you Give say Give us a little bit of a farewell and hello. Get myself. I can get you. You just muted yourself again, Marlene. Uh oh, I'm sure she's saying. Uh, okay, can you hear there me? There we go. There we go. It is just so wonderful to see everybody. Um, and if you're not a Saber member, we welcome you to join Saber. Zach and I have been doing um, monthly or so Saber meetings. There's lots of Zoom meetings that you can attend from all over the the country. Um, I'm just really pleased at the way the reunion went. Um, I really look forward to it every year and to seeing all of you folks. And uh, I was missing that. So it's good to see you all today. And, you know, I actually got to see some of you better than usual. And <laughs> Tom, I haven't heard you talk so much because you're usually, I'm usually at a table, but I really enjoyed your stories today, Tom. You're very so, welcome. Happy holidays to everybody. Please Thank stay you, safe. And Thank Zach you, and Mark, thanks for everything. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Marlene. <laughs> thanks, Marlene. Well, thanks, everybody. We'll go ahead and wrap it up, but- uh, Mark, thank you, Mark. I can't, uh, can't thank you all enough for making this happen and for joining us today. Hope everybody stays safe, has a great holiday season, and we really hope to uh, reconnect in 2021. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Happy holidays. Putting, uh, that book